Hello everyone, I'm Chris Mizzillo Saturnson and this is a game review of Persona Q Shadow of the Labyrinth. A combination of both Persona and Etrian Odyssey, uh, Persona Q is a first person dungeon crawler, much like Etrian Odyssey, but with both story and like character elements of P the Persona franchise. Does it work? Yeah, I've never played an Etrian Odyssey game, but I have played both Persona 3 and 4. So there's that. The story is sort of split into two halves, as depending on which uh, Persona main character you pick, whether they're 3 or 4, you get slightly alterations in like conversations and minor plot details. So really, I mean, there's ultimately just one main plot, but there's a few minor tweaks and changes if you want to play it twice. Take a long time. Because of this, I went with the Persona 4 main character just because well, I prefer most of the characters from Persona 4. Despite using mainly Persona 3 characters in my party. Anyway, one day the investigation team are enjoying their culture festival where they decide to go into the Velvet Room where they hear this mysterious bell ring off in the distance. When they return back to their school, they've realised that something is slightly off, where they seemingly aren't at their own culture festival anymore, and all the displays are giant labyrinths. It's here that they meet two new characters for the game, being Zen and Ray, who have been trapped in this like alternate culture festival for quite some time, and are sort of maybe looking for a way out. They also happen to stumble upon the seas from Persona 3, and together they all join a force to, you know, find a way out of this rather uniquely themed labyrinth. Both teams end up joining midway through their respective investigations and quests, meaning they, like, most of the characters haven't reached their, like, full development yet. This means that we get to see these characters develop in a slightly different manner from their interactions with each other and this are the other team and Zen and Ray. Obviously, this story is quite light. Uh, this story is more light-hearted than most Persona games, most notable from the adorable art style. However, characters like while they seem like just caricatures of themselves, and you know they've taken the one or two aspects from that personality and blown it way out of proportion, they still develop. A, either a small amount or quite a large amount, and especially in the sense of like Kanji and Ken who have this massive arc throughout the entire game. The art style ends up making several characters just obscenely adorable, most notably Koromaru and also somehow I guess. In terms of new characters, uh, Rei is like vomit inducingly adorably cute, like everything she does is this weird like so goddamn cute. It's weird, but at the same time, she doesn't. She's not like completely without any level of depth. Is is greatly explored later on into the game. The same also goes for Zen, minus the cute part, sort of. Is it's just interesting watching these two kind of stumble around their emotions. As you know, Zen has no memory, Ray has no memory, and they're all just trying to like work shit out together. And it's just like watching this happen is interesting. As you explore the various dungeons, you have to make your own maps. And for some reason, I got greatly into this. Is, you know, your keys for the maps start out fairly simple when the dungeons are just like, you know, fairly linear with a few branching paths, but nothing too complex. And then you'll quickly realize that your mapping scheme is getting crazier and crazier as either like, things are getting more complex or you just realise you got to note down more things, and there's something so incredibly satisfying about the idea that the map you have drawn is almost entirely unique to yourself, as you yourself have used different symbols for different things, and there's just this level of satisfaction of just using, of like, as you slowly develop in your own head, ideas for what different symbols can mean and what you can note down differently in the most like efficient way through different numbers and symbols and colours. It's really kind of in, like grasping. This paired with like 
the puzzles on each floor turn something which is generally considered cumbersome and annoying being map making into something really engrossing and addictive as you you know note down more and more information onto your map in when you get to the final point and you've got everything noted down and you stare at your map and trying to get to it all click in your head and then you know and when it does there's such a level of satisfaction it's like you think I worked this out I did all the legwork I wrote everything down I've you know got everything sorted and it was all because of my unique system and it's just satisfying the later the dungeon in the game obviously generally the more complex the puzzle is which is both great and also has some major flaws. The main flaw that comes to mind for me is that very late in the game, uh, the floors themselves are massive, and you've got these puzzles which span two massive floors which take up the entire fucking grid. And that paired with like how the monster, the shadow battles themselves get more and more complex and more difficult, means that these puzzles can take fucking ages to complete. I mean, this could have been somewhat alleviated by the fact that you can actually increase the game, the, like, the battle speed, however I only found that out once I'd finished the game. The dungeons themselves also function in the same way that the Persona 4 dungeons function, thankfully, than the Persona 3 ones, in that each one has its own unique theme and is like actually has connotations to it, so you've got these greatly unique ideas and dungeons which you feel all link into the plot instead of like in Persona 3 where it's just a simple cat power swap and for like 500 floors and feels like it has nothing to do with the plot. There's a large amount of symbolism throughout the entire thing so you've got this you've still got that like super heavy Persona story to it just brought on through these symbols and this just the connotations of everything everything feels like it's actually related to the plot which is really nice dealing with themes of both death and self-identity at the same time it ties in both persona 3 and 4 and ultimately quickly adds this like very dark side to the story like in other persona games so it actually develops more from just a semi-comedic romp through a persona game into a standard persona game but slightly more lighter. The music in the game is obviously fucking great. It's a Persona game after all, the music is always great in those. It was one of the first things that, you know, stood out to me in the game, was just like how jamming the music was. Well, obviously other than the, the great visuals. The combat has some elements from Persona 3, such as the different basic attack types, as well as the inclusion of different rows, and thankfully being able to control every person in your party. Also, each party member has their own sub-persona due to plot reasons, instead of the main character being able to swap between 10 different personas on the fly, everyone has one additional persona to their, you know, main one. This led me to rarely change my sub-personas, as there's no social links, creating a new sub-persona, they don't get this like, big level boost to kinda, you know, work them through and give them that little power spike to make it seem worthwhile. Instead, when they when you make a new persona, you they just lack the skills which you may have had on your previous one, which is kind of vital because you you know you need to have all the different elements and in order to efficiently take out monsters because those elemental weaknesses are key for both preserving HP and uh, SP as well as for just dealing with the the shadows because they're fucking difficult, as well as being time efficient in like. So you don't have to constantly go back and heal all your SP up. You'll find that you have like a, a few personas, which you know, you, once you have, uh, once you have all your elements filled and all your healing stuff secured, you don't want to really change anything because you need all of that stuff, and it's all like kind of key to the way your party works. So if you were to replace this persona, which has you know all the relevant stuff to make up for this one person's weaknesses, only a handful of those skills will pass through. And even then, this new persona you've created may not have, you know, the stuff you need. So you've end up got you then build this hole into it because they have this persona, which may level up down the road to be really good, initially has this like power gap to your previous one. It got to the point where a lot of personas I made from like early on to the game just persisted for ages. A few examples are such as Orpheus Telos, who was a free persona you got as DLC content. He starts out level 26, by the end of the game was like 
level 65 on my main character. That's obscene, because he was just like, his, what he had, was essentially kind of what I needed for the main character, as it had healing and, you know, all this sort of stuff, and it was essential for my party to work. Another example would be a Biako, which starts at like 61, I think, and then by, by the time I got rid of him and replaced him, because he was so good at ice, he was like, you know, 79-ish, roughly, which is obscene. I should have upgraded and changed much earlier than that. The sub personas also give you like bonus HP and SP which replenishes each battle so as to, you know, make using your magic and you know your abilities more efficient as you're not just constantly burning through your uh, HP and SP. Instead like you would think that the later the persona is and like the higher level the persona is in terms of base persona, the more HP and SP you'd get. But the thing I found was there were a few which gave like, oh, this gives 130 HP and like 20 SP really early on. And then like 20, 40 levels later, they were still just giving 130 and 20 as like their base amount. And by that time, the sub persona I was using had leveled up greatly to have, say, like 180 extra HP and 50 extra SP. And so if I were to get rid of my like persona I was using, I'm suddenly finding myself like lacking in large amounts of HP and SP because it's just not as leveled up. If it were to level up, it could be greater. But there's just that initial like diminish in power that can greatly affect your game. The later personas, such as you know the very end game ones like Satan and Odin, you know the, what is traditionally the like the the final ones for the social links and the Arcan the final Arcana ones. They've obviously got like a slightly boost to the HP and SP, but they're all like level 72 through to 82, so you know, you only get to change your stuff at the final point, only for you to realise, shit a brick, levelling up takes a lot of time now, and all I don't have access to any of these like final persona skills. Should've just kept with my current ones which had all the ele you know, the elements and healing all tightly knit together. And it wouldn't be a Persona game without a few cheap bosses, most notably for me, the final two, as the penultimate boss is just this really long grind where it has like periods where it can't be damaged unless you deal, like it has four legs which all have their own elemental weakness, and you have to kill those to even do damage to the main body, which means that you quickly burn through all of your SP doing your elemental attacks and stuff, and then these legs respawn continuously. So you have to keep on getting rid of them, and by the time you've beaten that boss, you've burned through a lot of your items and most of your SP and stuff. And then it turns out that the final boss is even more annoying. So, and you're already like weakened because you're out of like items and stuff, and this boss has like a death timer, which basically means that after a certain number of turns, that character dies and there's nothing you can really do about it, despite delaying it by one turn by using like either a revive item, such as a revival bead, or the um, resurrection spell, like Recon. Then you can only delay it by one turn by doing that, meaning like people will die inevitably, but if you're lucky you can sort of delay it on one person indefinitely. And, oh, and when you die to that boss, and the penultimate boss took like a fucking hour to get through, it's fucking annoying. It's like the 12 stage boss in like Persona 3 all over again. Also, some of the FOEs, which are, or foes, which are the larger, bigger monsters that appear on the field and are generally the basis around certain puzzles in the game, they can also be incredibly annoying. Some end up moving three spaces for each of your one movement, so they'll inevitably catch you if you want to try and escape, which takes fucking ages. And then it turns out that this monster has, like, Mahama or Mamudo, which are the, you know, party-wide instant kill spells. So your entire party is just wiped instantly, and there's nothing you could do about it. Thankfully, thank fuckfully, the, like, normal shadows throughout the entire game, very few of them actually have these instant kill spells. So you, whilst you're actually just doing your normal, your normal dungeon crawling stuff, you find yourself rarely just instantly wiped for cheap reasons and losing several hours of fuck, several hours of gameplay like you would in previous Persona games, which is always fucking annoying. The main character can die and then be brought back to life, 
and it's not the end of the world. That's always a good thing. For me, there was this, like, a bit of disappointment at the very end, where, while this isn't greatly a spoiler, I mean, it's pretty obvious, Margaret goes like, oh yeah, by the way, you'll, like, have literally no memories of any of this ever happening. Ha 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 Which is annoying, because you get some characters which develop so greatly and are so affected by this, like, you know, encounter with the other characters from the different game, that it's a little disappointing when you realise that that was all for not. This 100 hour development cycle you had going on, because it's like a 100 hour game, that, that's all just like gone and thrown to the wind. But at the same time, just as a standalone game, it's not so damning to just like erase everything you've witnessed. It's still like significant, the development, but it's a little annoying that it's just like. And then it was basically the like, it was all a dream ending. That, that sort of bullshit of like, and then you forgot everything that happened for continuity reason. Ooh. If you like the Persona series, I would greatly suggest it as like, the Yetri and Odyssey aspects aren't so completely different to Persona to make it a bit too different and weird and like, alien. And it's still got like, the great Persona aspects such as like, the zanier but also more endearing Persona 4 characters and then also the colder and more serious Persona 3 characters, all to tie in this, like, very dark and heavy themed plot. And, it was, you know, it was great, with the biggest flaw just being, like, some of the dungeon floors drag on a bit too much. Just a smidge. Hello, and thank you for watching my video! If you liked it, feel free to, you know, leave a comment down below or maybe even leave a like. Or share it with someone who may also like it, or hate it. If you hated it, also leave a comment down below telling me how much you hate it and why. I love improving myself and also being abused online but on the internet. Until that's great. If you enjoyed this, why not check out some of my other videos that you can see on the screen, or even subscribe if you're insane, and if you didn't enjoy it then well, no. send me a flaming poop in the mail, cause that's fun. And this is a game review of... That was awkward. I've never played an Etrian Odyssey game, but I have played both Persona Q. Of course I have, it's what I'm reviewing. You look at the map and try and wait, try and get... Done, <clears throat> and it wouldn't... Whoop.